we're not going to have this discussion at this point. I told you I don't want to have you going in the house right now, and that's it, okay? Welcome to another video in the Watch Me Make Offers live video series here on the channel where you get to look over my shoulder and watch me make offers on distressed real estate properties. And this deal on today's video is an off-market tired landlord. Now I do a lot of offers directly to private sellers and every now and then I can't get the seller to cooperate with me and this is one of those sellers. So if you'd like to see how not to take no for an answer, this video is for you. Get ready to watch me make an offer to a difficult seller coming up. For a limited time, you can get a free copy of Jerry Norton's Motivated Seller Scripts so you can talk to, email, and text sellers with confidence. Download it now at freesellerscripts.com. If you're new here to this... If you're new here, I'm Jerry Norton. I went from dead broke to millionaire flipping real estate. And after doing a thousand deals, I created this channel to help you master the art of wholesaling and flipping real estate so you can live your dream life. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified when new videos are released. Have you ever been intimidated to make offers when talking to sellers? Have you ever had a seller push back on your offer and you didn't know what to do? Have you ever been frozen about what to say or how to handle seller objections? And have you ever gotten frustrated trying to close with a difficult seller? If you have, welcome to the wonderful world of becoming a real estate investor. Not only is that normal and not only does that happen often in this business, it's to be expected. No going into conversations that difficult sellers are common and not knowing how to handle that is normal. Accepting that reality is the first step to confronting the fear of rejection and the fear of not having the answers and the fear of looking stupid and the fear of not knowing what to do and the feeling of frustration. Once you accept that sellers are sometimes difficult and it's okay and that you don't have to have all the answers, it allows you to go through the experience, learn from it, make mistakes, try again, and get better. Do that enough times and it becomes second nature. But make no mistake, the only way to get better on the phones and talking to sellers is to just do it. Remember, every expert was once a beginner. Now in a minute, we're gonna to cut to a live call I had with a difficult seller. At one point, she even hung up on me. And I'm gonna break down my attempt to negotiate and close the deal. This was an off-market lead from an absentee owner list, which means the seller doesn't live in the property. So we skip traced the phone number and my cold call team called the seller to see if she was interested in selling her property and she said she was interested. Now at that point, the lead was passed to me to call and close the deal. And the notes from my cold caller said the property was currently tenant occupied and the seller no longer wanted to be a landlord. We refer to this as a tired landlord. So I called the seller to make a cash offer. Now before we cut to the call, whenever talking to sellers, there are four primary objectives that I wanna accomplish in order to properly make an offer. They are motivation or the seller's reason for selling, the time frame or how soon they wanna sell, the condition of the property, and the price the seller wants. So as I break down this call, I'm gonna point out how I uncovered those four things. Initially, everything went normal. Take a listen. Hi Jane, this is Jerry Norton. Uh, you spoke to my team earlier today, I believe, about your property. Yes. Great, do you have a minute? I wanted to talk to you about that. Sure. Okay, I'm interested in making a cash offer on that property. I understand you're using it as a rental right now? Right. Okay. And tell me about that. So you've got a tenant in place. What's their lease arrangement right now? Uh, she's on a month to month. Okay. And she is going to be moving out because I basically would want to go ahead and get the house sold this spring. I see. <clears throat> so pretty standard. I verified she wanted to sell. And then I asked about the tenant and the tenant is on a month to month lease and is planning on moving out. So that sounds great. Everything is going good so far. Then I asked why she is looking to sell. Now the reason why I like to ask that question is to uncover the problem or the pain point. In other words, what's the motivation to sell the property at a discount to a cash buyer like me? Knowing that allows you to focus on a solution to the problem when making the offer. But when I asked Jane that question, she took offense. Take a listen to what she said and how I responded. And wh why is it that you're wanting to sell right now? What? Why does everybody ask that question? 
I just don't want to have a bunch of houses anymore. I'm, I'm tired of being a landlord. I'm getting ready to retire, and I want to sell. Why does it make a difference to you why I want to sell? Because it helps me understand if there's something else going on that I should know about. <laughs> like you can make a lower offer. Okay, got it. Uh, the roof is caving in, the basement's leaking, the tenant no, hasn't paid in nine months. That. That. Well, that's, we that's why somebody would ask you that question. So that's all. Yeah. Just what, is there something going on, and that's the reason why you're selling, or is it just because you don't want to? You don't want it anymore. I don't really care. I'm just trying to understand why you're yeah. why we're talking. No, it's because I I do not want to be in the landlord business anymore. Okay. I work I work full time. I'm old, um, but I still work full time, and I'm sick and tired of managing houses too. So she did not like that question and insinuated that I was asking that to somehow take advantage of her situation and offer a lower price. Now that told me I wasn't the first cash buyer she's spoken to. Now clearly this woman has a wall up. She does not trust me. This is an opportunity for me to try and make her feel comfortable. Remember, people do business with people they like and trust. Now I actually didn't handle that very well and I was annoyed by her accusation. I immediately fired back at her that I asked that question to give her an opportunity to disclose any issues or problems going on. Now, it wasn't so much what I said, but how I said it. My tone and attitude was not very inviting, which did not help my cause at all, even though she backed down and ended up answering the question that she was just tired of landlording. So in my defense, I realized that I came across a little abrasive, so I tried to rebound the situation by talking about how difficult it is to manage tenants. My hope was that we could relate on that topic and I could open the door to building trust. Take a listen. Gotcha, well I can, I can understand that. That's uh, tenants aren't always a fun thing to do, so that's totally get that. Well, it, it's not so much the, well, it is the tenants because some, some tenants just don't know how to deal with anything in the houses. Uh -huh. um, but that, that's one of the issues that's the, you know, oh, you know, I, I screwed up and I left the tub running too long and now it's leaking someplace and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, oh, I flushed tampons down the toilet. You're not supposed to do that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. or, gotcha. Or the, or the young women who, for some reason, keep dropping the little rings that come off when they open a jug of milk and getting it caught in the garbage. Oh, yeah. But, but, they're, but they're too delicate to put their hands down there to get it out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they want yeah. the handyman to come out and do that. Gotcha. Yeah, the handyman in that case is me. And right. it's like, yeah, it's fine for me to stick my hand down there, but you can't do it. So not a bad recovery. We complained together about tenants. This is a sales technique known as matching and mirroring. By agreeing with her that it's hard to manage tenants, we relate on a certain level and that builds trust. Now next, I moved right along to find out about the condition of the property. Since I haven't seen this property, I need to get an idea of what the issues are. Take a listen. Right. Do you have other properties you're looking to sell as well or just this one? Um, I, I don't have any more okay. in uh, Michigan. We, this is the last one. Okay. Other than our, the house we live in. I see. Well, I do a lot of properties in the area. Like I said, I am cash and can, can buy it as is. I'd probably want to take a look at that lease agreement and just make sure I understand that. But if it's month to month and they're, and they're planning on yeah. leaving, that might work out great anyway because, you know, we do a lot of flips too. And, and it's a four bedroom? Yes. So is, that, is there two up in the bungalow or how's the, how's the floor plan? Yeah, it's um, two bedrooms with a bath in between on the first floor, two bedrooms with a bath in between on the second floor. Okay, and then the basement's just unfinished? Yes, there is a really crummy bathroom in the basement. I have never bothered fixing it up. Okay. But all, I mean, it, it has a sink and a shower and stuff in it, um, but I mean, you'd have to be desperate to want to use it, but all the plumbing and everything is there, and you could easily fix that up to use that as well. Okay, and is the basement dry or wet, soggy? Yeah. How's, how's the basement? No, it's, it's dry. We haven't okay. had any problems with that. I mean, like, what, what would you say are the major issues with the house if you were to identify, you know, things that would need done? The kitchen countertops need to be replaced um, as well as the floor 
in okay. the kitchen, and the floor in the upstairs bathroom needs to be replaced. But roof is pretty good, 10 years? Yes. Um, I, that, I don't think it was 10 years. I think it was eight years ago we replaced the roof. Okay. No AC, but furnace is good? Yes. Okay. So everything seemed to go normal here. I asked several questions about the property and the condition, and it didn't appear to have too many issues. So up until this point, I've uncovered that her motivation is she's a tired landlord and the property is in decent condition. That means there are two things I need to discover, her timeline for when she wants to sell and price. So I point blank asked her when she wants to sell. Take a listen. I mean, how soon are you looking to do something? I need to find out exactly when she's going to be out um, but as soon as she can be out, I want to go ahead and get it sold. Okay. Um, very honestly, I was giving myself time to get it fixed up to put on the market. Mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to make sure that we had it on by at least late spring this year. But if we agreed on a price, you would be open to selling it as is already before it's vacant and without doing any work on it? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I asked her when she wants to sell, she mentioned not until after the tenant moves out and that she was planning on doing some work and listing it in the spring, which is like two or three months away from the time of this video. So I asked her a very important qualifying question. If we agree on a price, are you willing to sell it as is right now? And she said she was, which later you'll see she clearly wasn't, but for now we've uncovered motivation, condition, Timeline and last is price. Take a listen. Okay, and what would that number look like to do as is, no repairs or anything like that, close even before the tenant's out, depending on when they go? I'd want 200 for it. Okay. And just so you know, two years ago, we had it up for sale. We listed it for 185 and sold it the first week we had it up. Uh, unfortunately, the people that that bought it ended up not being able to get a loan in spite of the fact that they were pre-approved. By the time we realized they were not going to get be able to get a loan, we were into August. And that was when the woman who's there now had rented from us before. Uh -huh. And she happened to call me at that point and said, um, you know, is there any chance that I could rent from you again? She was renting someplace where they were selling the house and she wasn't going to be able to stay there. So, okay, so, so you just she, kept it as a rental? How, yeah, and that's, that's how, um, you know, I wasn't sure how well we would do trying to sell it into the winter. And um, she had to call at the right time so that she moved back in. Okay. You know, a 185 offer on market, there's about 11000 in commissions and closing plus closing fees. Yeah. The number I would love to be at that would make it, you know, worth a cash offer as is, you know, tenant tenant that needs to go and all of that is like around 175 over in that neighborhood. I mean, I could do, I could probably do a little bit more, like closer to that 185, which is still still better than, um, you know, 185 on market because there's no commissions with right. me. Even at 185, well, I, I've had it, I've had it appraised. Um, and I've talked to realtors and it's appraised for 240 in its current condition. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking right now on your street at two comps. I mean, if you, if you Google this thing on Zillow, you should see it. It's 265 and it is done to the nines. Brand new kitchen, brand new appliances, backsplash, staged, all refinished wood floors. It's super nice. Uh-huh. 265. That's spending forty, fifty thousand dollars landscaping, new siding, new roof, new everything, and that's on okay. Hazelhurst recent comp. There's another one that got a little bit higher. That's two seventy three, um, and it's a three bedroom, three bath. So they did. It's like finished basement, and again, on Hazelhurst. So it's not like this comp is, and it is. Sure. It is completely renovated with this big you know, built on deck and everything. I mean, Ferndale will get a number like that, but it's it's gonna take work, you know, like you're gonna have to put money into it to get, it won't get 240 if it's not, there's not work done on it. Well, actually you don't know that. <laughs> well, you, you are I don't, you're right, I don't know that. that I'm just- be done, But you don't know it, you, you don't know what needs to be done. You haven't been in it. Well, no, but from what you've said to me, if a tenant's been living in it, trust me, it needs work. 
Okay. I mean, it just does, right? Yeah. I mean, you got one here that sold a two bedroom that sold on Hazelhurst for 101, but it's a two bedroom, needed a bunch of work. And then here's here's one on Parson Street over, sold for 226. Looks pretty clean, you know. But like, if I buy it cash, come in and put a bunch of money into it, then you know, like 185 is like a good number for that. Okay. I mean, but no commission. The the thing of it is, is just ease of ease of the trans of the transaction, right? So no, no commissions, no buyer's agent, no inspections, no appraisals, no buyer coming back saying, I want you to fix this and that and this and that. It's just kind of like convenient and easy. So uh, would you buy it then with no inspections? I would just need a quick walkthrough just to make sure, you know, there's not a foundation issue or, you know, whatever the roof's falling off something big. But yeah, I would waive inspection. I don't need an inspection. It's not like I, I'm buying it as is, so I don't care that it needs flooring or whatever is wrong. That's fine. Okay. So yeah, okay. I just would send my guy over there like today or whenever as fast as we can and then no ins and then waive inspection. So a lot happened in that clip. She wanted 200,000 and she explained how she had it sold on market for 185,000 and then it fell through. And I tried to explain to her that on market at 185,000 is not the same as, as is cash. Between closing fees and commissions, 185,000 is gonna cost like $15,000 in commissions and closing fees. So I started at 175,000 and then I immediately said I could probably come up to 185,000. Now the reason I did that was to communicate that I can't go any higher than 185 because I really wanna be at 175. Now her response was that it appraised for 240,000. Now guys, no one is gonna beat me at this game with logic. I know my numbers, I know my market, I do my homework before every call and I'm prepared to talk about it. So when she said that it appraised for 240,000, I pointed out to her two fully renovated fix and flip comps on the same street as her house that sold for 265 and 273 and that her house would need 40 to $50,000 in work and that it wouldn't get 240,000. Now, she didn't like that and told me I didn't know it wouldn't sell for 240,000. So I was like, "Are you kidding me? There's a tenant living there. It's going to need work done." I even pointed out more comps. So she seemed to come around, she asked about an inspection, and I reassured her that I would buy it as is. And right when I thought we had a deal, she got all hung up on getting the tenant vacated first. Take a listen. Here's what we'll have to do, um, because she has started moving things out, but she's, she's being very slow about it. Uh -huh. um, she's got stuff just all over the place. So I don't know exactly what day she's going to be out of there. Okay. I've talked with her and I've talked with her father, both, who, who's helping her at this point. And he said to me, well, the only day I have to go over and help is Sunday. So we, you know, we're not getting things done very fast. So if, if you would give me a call back in, I don't know, a couple of weeks, and I can give you a better idea of exactly when it's going to be vacant, that would be great. Well, why do you need it to be vacant? Because I don't want to go in and interrupt her while she's trying to get things ready to move. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is, as long as I feel comfortable that she's on her way out, I don't mind closing and then I've got to deal with some occupancy with her or you know she's on her way out. So my, my job would be to make this super easy for you where you don't have to deal with that anymore. Like we set a closing for 30 days. If she's not out by then, I deal with it. You don't have to deal with okay. it. Okay. It's not your problem anymore. It's my problem. You know, I would love it if she was out, but let's just say she's not. I'm not going to make that be a hang up. I mean, I'll just reach out and say, hey, I mean, it would be helpful to say, hey, I've got a buyer. We're selling the house. We're closing on this date. Can you, can you be out by then? And if she says yes, great. But let's say she's not, then I would have to deal with her. If part of what I want to try to make do for you is, Hey, I'm willing to deal. I'm, I'm willing to sell at a little bit of a discount to not have all the drama of vacating, cleaning it out, fixing some stuff, putting it on the market, showings, inspections, appraisals, buyers, agents, all of that. Sure. You know, you don't see money for 120 days or longer if you go that way versus let's just set a 30 day closing and be done with it. 
Uh, well, I would love to do that, but that it, it's just not going to work out to do that right at this point. So she explained that she wanted to wait until the tenant leaves, and she said to check back with her in a few weeks. Now that is bad news for doing a deal. Time kills all deals. If we wait until the tenant leaves, she'll have more options, and she already thinks the property is worth $240,000. What I want to do is I want to take it right now, and I'll deal with the tenant. And when I rewatch how I explained that, I thought I did a really good job of helping her see that she doesn't need to worry about the tenant anymore. I'll handle that. And her response was, that's not going to work out at this point. So this is where things took a turn for the worse. At this point, I've got nothing to lose. So I asked her, why not? And she didn't like that. Take a listen. It's just not going to work out to do that right at this point. Why? Um, I, I have an agreement with her. I do not want to disturb her right at this point. She's got, she's got a ton of stuff. She basically has been working out of the house and she has collected a lot of furniture and everything that she's trying to deal with at this point. And um, I, I, I just don't want to go in in the middle of all of this and try to deal with selling the house. Tell her not to worry about any of it. I'll trash it out. I trash out every day. What the? So let me get this straight. The tenant is a hoarder. She's collected a ton of crap and I'm offering to deal with it. I even offered to trash it out for the tenant. Just leave it all and I'll deal with it. Now, how am I not solving everybody's problem? The seller is tired of landlording. Great, I'll deal with the tenant. The tenant has junk they can't figure out how to get rid of. Great, I'll deal with it. How is this a bad plan? Then she hung up on me. So I called her back and assumed we got disconnected. Take a listen. Hello? Yeah, I think I got disconnected from you. Okay, we're not gonna have this discussion at this point. I told you I don't want to have you going in the house right now and that's it, okay? That's fine. If you're interested in talking with me down the road, that's uh -huh. fine, we can do that, but I, I'm not going to get into more hassle and everything at this point. I'm just not going to do it. I guess you're not understanding how I'm making it hassle-free, but that's, if there's something going on that you, that's unique between you and the tenant or whatever, that's, that's totally fine. I'm just trying to tell you I can make this super easy for everybody. Like, for example, just say, hey, I know you're really worried about all this crap you've collected. Don't worry about it. Just move out and leave whatever you don't want. No, that's... That's part of the issue. She wants to keep all of the stuff. Right, so take she, what, yeah, take what you want, whatever you don't want, leave, it's fine. Okay. Because hoarders don't, hoarders have a hard time dealing with their stuff. Like, if you leave it up to them, they'll never deal with it. They can't. I, I understand that. Um, I also have some things that are stored in a locked storage room there. Uh -huh. that I need to, I need to get out of there. And so I'm trying to deal with getting her out, getting her stuff out. Then I can get my stuff out. Then we can talk. Okay. That, so all of that's fine. We can put that in the contract. Like we, we close when she leaves. We close when I get my stuff out of there. And all of that's, I mean, we, we just put that in there. That's all. I mean, like why, why wait and not put a deal together if we can put a deal together and just have those terms in the contract? Is, I guess what I'm asking. Yeah, I, I tell you, I've, I've got a ton of other things going on right now that I'm needing to deal with, including a car that's a, my car that's at a dealership where they're telling me I need to have a new transmission put in. And so I'm dealing with a whole bunch of other issues right now. This just, I'm, I'm trying to deal with her the best I can. I just don't need extra things to deal with right now. So, as I said before, if you want to call me back at uh -huh. a later time, that'll be fine and we can discuss it. But I have other things I need to take care of in the meantime. And I'm, I'm not going to get into an additional hassle, and I don't care how you look at it. I look at it as an additional hassle on the house at this point. I guess I just not, not seen it quite that way. Why not get rid of the hassle? But 
Why don't I check? Uh, look, I'm done discussing it. If you want to call me back okay. in a couple of weeks or so, call me. Otherwise, we're done. Okay, I'll call you in a couple of weeks. So no matter what solution I offered, it just wasn't working for the seller. You know, I'm convinced some people just thrive on making their lives harder than it needs to be. They wouldn't know what to do if they didn't have problems all the time. Now, I probably should have let it go, but this is an investor, so I had a higher expectation, so I kept pressing her and challenging her position of wanting to wait to sign a contract until after the tenant moves out, and finally, we uncovered that she has her own stuff in the house. Now, all of this is easy to solve. We can put in the contract that we close when the tenant leaves, or we give the tenant time to leave, or I'll do the trash out, or I'll make sure that the seller gets her stuff out. I can easily solve all of these problems, but apparently she has got bigger problems like her transmission. Unbelievable. Clearly not a motivated seller. I don't think she's too fond of me, but we'll call her back in a few weeks and see what happens. Now there are four big lessons I wanna point out from this call. First is you're going to get difficult sellers. It's not gonna make any sense and that's okay. Sellers are people and people are emotional and emotions aren't always logical. Second, you have to be able to overcome objections. There is nothing a seller can throw at me that I don't have an answer for or can't solve. And the better you are at solving problems and the bigger problems you solve, the more money you make. Want to make more money? Solve more or bigger problems. The third lesson is to practice. The only way to get good talking to sellers is to practice. Never forget, imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. To help you get started, be sure to get my word-for-word -word seller scripts. I'll give them to you for free. Just go to freesellerscripts.com. And finally, the fourth lesson is to not lose your temper or get frustrated when the call doesn't go how you hoped. Stay calm, smile. If you're like me and you love to win, that can be hard sometimes, but your attitude comes across on the phone. Even though this call was not a win, if you still learn something, leave a comment and say, Jerry, you're still a flipping genius. Next, to really grasp this concept, I want you to watch another live call breakdown with a different difficult seller where I kept my cool. So watch that now, and if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to my channel. With over 625 videos, this is the number one channel on YouTube for all things wholesaling and flipping, and I'll see you on the next video.